Most estimates suggest the Indian economy has the potential to double over the next uh, uh, two decades or so. Uh, and what that will mean, the kind of power that will unleash, the kind of opportunities it opens up are immense, but it comes with its own set of challenges as well. Uh, if this is going to be a once-in-a-generation shift, uh, what do we need to do to ensure that all of our cards are in the right Place. That is the question that I want to address with each one of you. Uh, Mr. Chandrasekhar, let me start by asking you. You know, uh, at the Delhi launch, we had the External Affairs Minister. Yes, you. <laughs> yes, you. Uh, since, since, since you have, since uh, the, the cliche of software to salt conglomerate, you have your uh, finger on just about every industry. So let me get started with you, Mr. Chandrasekhar. At the Delhi launch, the External Affairs Minister said that, look, uh, India is uniquely positioned, uniquely poised, but let's not go around looking for the China fix of efficiency. If we don't go looking for the China fix of efficiency, what is the India fix going to be over the next 25 years? Um, Shirin, you heard this from me before, so I'm going to repeat it. Um, see, it's uh, definitely a very, very uh, unique opportunity. I'm going to take a little bit of time. Go ahead. Uh, before I start, I want to first congratulate Amitabh Kant uh, on the launch of the book and also for all that he has done from a government service. He is someone who has created a magical brand multiple times. What he did with God's own country and repeated it with Incredible India. Now, with India being at the high table in G20, repeating it for the third time. So, a remarkable individual, great accomplishments, and many things have already been said about Amitabh, so I don't want to add anything is more. Is he the India fix? Is Amitabh Kant, huh? the, Indi is Amitabh Kant the India fix? <laughs> so, let me congratulate Amitabh, first of all, on the book. It's a great book. We'll come to that later. Now, coming to the question that you asked, I think it is a unique opportunity for India for multiple reasons. There are three transitions and there are moving geopolitical situations. From the transitions point of view, the first is digital and AI, Second one is energy. Third one is supply chain. In all the three transitions, I would say that India is probably the best place country in the world. First, on the digital, just two primary reasons. First, there is no country in the world which has demonstrated a large-scale digital intervention and digital platform for public services delivery, which is transformative at scale. I think, you know, everyone who has had lived abroad in any country or has done business anywhere, whether it is the UPA, whether it is the Aadhaar, whether it is Jandan Yojana, I mean, you can go on and on. The second thing on the digital side is it's no secret that we have the best talent available from a digital point of view for the future. And the scale and the depth that India has, again, is unparalleled. You can add all the talent that's available from next 10 countries, still they will fall short. So these two are big tailwinds. If you take the energy transition, India is probably the only country in the world which have to which has to achieve the energy transition purely only accounting for growth most other people whatever be the country you take their energy transition to renewable or new energy what have you has to be substitution shutting down what is working and then but whereas in india if whatever be the doubling, tripling, whatever is the GDP number you take by 2047, the needs 
of growth that we have between now and 2047 or 2050 is at least three times more than what we have. And all of this will be new energy. And we will do renewables, we will, we will do wind, we will do solar, we will do SMR, we will do 10 other technologies. And that is a unique opportunity because with growth you can fix anything. Priority should be growth, growth, growth. And when you do something for growth, you are not so much uh, under stress like when you do it for substitution. The third thing, whether you call it uh, this country fix, that country fix, it doesn't matter. To my mind, the global supply chain is going to be rebuilt. And it is being rebuilt as we speak. It is not that it is going to happen, it is beginning, it is happening. We are in the middle of that. Sometimes you don't realize when something is happening. You always connect the dots backwards. And any supply chain is an ecosystem play. So I keep referring as India Plus. I never use any other example of saying that we are replacing somebody. We are not replacing anyone. We have an opportunity to create a global alternative supply chain base which I call it as India Plus because India can't do it alone. But just the sheer size, scale and everything else that we have positions India to be the lead in this alternative supply chain. Somebody else cannot take the lead. It has to be India and India is taking that lead and the supply chain will get built over the next 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. But above all of this, there is one fundamental factor, which is, I have to say this, under the leadership of Prime Minister Modi, what has fundamentally changed is the belief and the aspiration of every Indian and every sector. You can feel it in the urban, you can feel it in the rural, you can feel it in poor people, rich people, educated, uneducated, it is there everywhere. As a country, we had the audacity in the middle of the COVID. When every other nation was going after Pfizer and Moderna, which normally we would have done, how to find the money, run helter skelter, to see how to get Moderna, Pfizer, or which country we can import from. Instead of all that, to say that we'll build our own vaccine in the middle of a crisis. There is something to be said about that. So this whole make in India, I mean, honestly, if you ask all of us in this room, we will recognize this make in India started as a campaign, a slogan, so everybody thought it will be a slogan. The slogan became a movement. Movement became a belief. Now we are in the execution phase. So there is no question it is going to happen. So I really believe that we should give ourselves the chance. And we have to make bets. We have to take risks. Everything we do will not work. But it's okay. Mr. Kotak, you know, everyone's talking about how uh, we can double as an economy by 2030 and so on and so forth. One issue I think we need to be mindful of, and I think Mr. Kanta uh, mentions that in his book very specifically, uh, is let's not get carried away with five to number three in the world, but let's focus also as far as per capita is concerned. And there is a big difference there. There is a big difference between us and some of the countries that we just spoke of. Uh, the other issue is the issue of financing. We have this aspiration. What will it take to finance this aspiration? Where will the financing come in from? And what do you believe will need to be done in terms of capacity and capability building specifically from that perspective? Thank you, Shireen. Uh, first, uh, congratulations to Amitabh. <clears throat> I think it's a fantastic book, and if you read the whole book, you must not miss the last chapter. The last chapter is about our future. And it reminds me of a simple line. Let's not keep the baggage of history, but learn from the lessons of history. And that's, in my view, what Amitabh's book 
highlights. Let's keep the lessons and move forward. The second thing which I have seen Amitabh in his own career, he has always explored the art of the possible and he's now mastering the science of execution because both going together is what is going to make it happen. So coming first, I must, in that context on the financial sector, I'm saying this uh, with all uh, genuineness that India stands out as the most, one of the most stable financial systems in the world today. And I want to publicly congratulate the RBI and the government for an outstanding job of making India stand out. And when I look at every night or every morning, one more bank in the US is in trouble or somebody in Europe is trouble in trouble, I say, we've got something right. We've got our act together. We've created a stable financial system, well capitalized, and it's a Goldilocks time. Lowest non-performing assets, clean credit, reasonable growth in the book, and none of these risk issues like we are seeing in the developed nations. So I genuinely feel very good about the stability and the solidity of the Indian financial sector. Having said that, taking a cue from Amitabh, where do we go from here? And how do we take this wonderful situation we are in? I think we need to be feeling good about ourselves, but always introspecting. What is it that we can do better? So if I think about capacity building in the financial sector, we really need to get some of the important guardrails in place. I think the concept of IBC was a great concept. It really was the basis of creditor being in control, but I think there is work to be done. I think we really need to fix the judicial system, which is consistent with a bankruptcy law, because at the end of the day, if banks lend money, we must be able to recover the money. If we have a problem there, it constrains our ability to take better risk. In the same context, I think we must now get this balance right between the needs of the corporate sector. When Chandra tells me that he wants to buy a 50,000 crore company in India, I have to tell him. <laughs> I will have to tell him, Chandra, please go to a foreign bank and get it funded outside. Because I cannot fund you in India. If we have to grow forward, I think these are risks. I think Indian banks have to be able to understand and manage these risks, like acquisition financing, mm -hmm. project financing. We got into trouble on infrastructure financing. Yeah. If you look at 2008 to 2018, it was a year when we did not get infrastructure financing right, and banks took the wrong risks because the guardrails of the system were not in place. Therefore, we need a unified, well-coordinated system, and I do believe India has the brain power and the risk management to be able to manage a financial sector which meets the aspirations of all of India's growth as we go forward. Has he been talking to you about making a 50,000 crore rupee acquisition? He doesn't talk anything <laughs> below 100,000. <000. laughs>We don't just create new standards. We create new priorities for the Indian car buyer. In fact, we make the whole world of India's mobility new forever. With the aim to become the food bowl of the world, government of Telangana hosted the first edition of the food conclave. The event brought together top agri-food industry leaders and stakeholders to identify key challenges and opportunities for the growth in the sector. Watch the Food Conclave, hosted by Government of Telangana in association with CNBC TV 18 and this time. <laughs> Z-Black Premium Agarbatti and Dhub, official prayer partner, Delhi Capitals. Let's address the issue of growth and 
Uh, and therein, the kind of power of consumption that we can possibly see being unleashed if we do see this per capita jump that everyone's talking about. The other issue I want to raise with you is the power of technology, something that Chandra started by saying he believes the digitization transition is going to be one of the big growth engines fueling our future. As you look at where we are today and as the landscape plays itself out, what are the big bets that you're willing to make on the power of consumption and technology? Sure. But thanks, Sheen, for that. But before I answer that, I want to go back to the history that everyone's talking about. And I just, uh, being a startup representative, a startup entrepreneur here, I want to just say that uh, just around the time when uh, Startup India movement started, and I think that big photograph of uh, Modi ji on a stage with a lot of startup startup entrepreneurs, all very young. I'm one of the oddities there, but. Uh, gave a lot of credibility to startup uh, businesses. And if I remember that day in 2015, and I have to talk ground floor level because that's where I am vis-a-vis -vis the two gentlemen here. So uh, if I talk about that, like our turnover is, uh, was about 20 crores. And from there, we've grown about 300 times. And that is, the co that is what gives us confidence that uh, you know, tomorrow is also there for our uh, platforms. As I travel and meet our uh, brand partners all over the world in beauty and in fashion, which are, which are important industries for those who believe they're not, but I do because I think consumers love them. But I think for those, what I can say is that uh, they are noticing India and they are noticing India, power of Indian millennials, power of Gen Z, which is coming of age. And they are very excited about what India has to offer. I think India is becoming one of the top markets for all these players. And I'm convinced that the next decade will be the decade for Indian consumption. It'll be the decade for, obviously, consumption is driven by income. So first incomes have to go up. But I'm very confident that the young India, with the power of uh, their enterprise, will take India into a generation where both income and consumption will grow. Talking of the platforms, <clears throat> I think Chandra already said that. We are very aware that our platforms are some of the best in the world. When we meet again, see these global partners, they compliment us for having one of the best platforms. Um, in, it's not just about coming from India, but it's in the world, one of the best platforms are coming out of India because of the sheer talent that is available and ability to do complex tasks. So I think if we were to marry technology with uh, problems that we need to solve in the country, which is what most of the startup entrepreneurs have addressed, I think the sky is the limit in terms of driving our Indian consumption and attracting many of the global players to come into India to address those markets. And of course, that doesn't mean we can't export. Sure. So beyond that, we'd of course like to dream how we can take our Indian brands into global markets. And that's a very crucial issue. And I know that Mr. Kant, that that is something that you're uh, very, very passionate about. How do we actually get India to export more? How do we get India to take more share uh, of global trade? And that's what I want to address with you. You know, you, you spoke very passionately about wanting to unleash and unshackle the private sector. Uh, you said that you want the private sector to flourish and you want the private sector to fly. Let's talk about the size problem that we have in this country. Uh, in your book, you address the issue of the fact that we've only got a handful of large conglomerates. Most of them are actually sitting on this stage and some of them are here in this room as well. How do you ensure that that number moves up? How do we ensure that, in your words, we have thousands of, you know, scale companies, not just small enterprises, not medium enterprises, but scale enterprises, because that is going to be responsible for the kind of growth aspiration that we have. Uh, so, Shireen, if you look back at uh, the years when India has really grown, and India has grown at 8 to 9 percent uh, for four to five years, uh, but it hasn't grown for, you know, decades like other countries have done, but every time we've done that, it's because our exports have grown. So exports are the key to growth, really. And that really means that you, you need companies who will who'll penetrate global markets. You need size and scale of manufacturing. And that's why we brought in the PLI scheme. The production-linked incentive scheme was very simple. Uh, it's, many people mistake it for subsidy. It's not. It says that you are here. We want you to go every year, keep raising your production from here to here, here to here, here to here, in five years' time. You fix your targets, achieve them. If you don't achieve them, you don't get it. But five years' time, it gives you this opportunity to become global in size and scale. And once you have companies of that global size and scale, 
you'll have tier two manufacturers, tier three, man like Maruti came in and all these MSMEs came in in automobile sector because of Maruti. Uh, it's an automatic backward forward linkage and therefore you need large companies for MSME to flow. I mean, for MSMEs will grow if you have very large companies and then they will penetrate global markets. It's very important. So I think for large companies to also happen in India, we need to scrap a lot of labor laws which were made a long time back. Uh, we need to decriminalize a lot, which the Prime Minister is pushing for. You need to make your infrastructure far more easy because your logistic costs are high. That's what Gati Shakti is doing. So a lot of that work is in action right now. And I think in the next two to three years, you'll see India becoming more and more, more and more efficient in many of these areas to enable large scale, size and scale. Without that, you know, I mean, look at a sector where India has the potential. I think to my mind, green hydrogen is the area where India has the potential. Today, the cost of producing green hydrogen is $4.5 per kilogram. India is the only country which is climatically blessed. It has top class entrepreneurship. It is possible for it to bring it down to $1 per kilogram. But it will not happen. And you can be the biggest producer and exporter to the world. But it will not happen without size and scale. So size and scale is really the key to it. Let's get into this issue of size and scale, and I'll get both Mr. Kotak and Mr. Chandrasekharan to address that. Mr. Kotak, why don't you go first? You know, whether it's banks, world-class and world-sized banks, which is what you were talking about, or it is world-sized and world-class companies that are exporting to the world. And of course, you know, he highlights the Korea example several times over in the book uh, to make that point. What will it take? for us to be able to build size and scale. This missing middle has been one of our perennial problems. How do we address that? Are we at an inflection point of being able to address it? I think the mindset is positive. The mindset is about reform, taking the country forward. Um, what we need to keep in mind is that as we go down this, we want many, many cars to run on the roads. And the more the cars are, the risk increases. There is, of course, a risk of accidents along the way. The answer to that is for us to get better road regulation, get our uh, systems, our signals, and all that in place, rather than taking an approach which we have taken historically, that, oh, because there are accidents, we don't want so many cars on the road. Let's encourage more cars. Let us encourage and build more roads. Traffic and uh, congestion is an inevitable part of it. We will manage it, but we will have to take the risks of potential accidents along the way and manage those accidents rather than saying we don't want accidents. Uh, you talked about bets and risks. What, what are the big bets and big risks that you're willing to make at this point in time, Chandra? Oh, forget about what I am willing to Why not? Uh, why, why forget that? So, that that's a barometer so, um, of, so, of what we can expect as far as the country is concerned, given no, your size and scale. No, we, we, uh, we are already doing uh, a number of things. We are uh, doing huge transitions in automotive. We have uh, pivoted to electric vehicles. We have uh, pivoted to fuel cells in commercial vehicles, then renewable power both size and transition we are doing. We are working on carbon capture. We are putting together the electronics vertical. We are putting together the mobile telephony infrastructure, whether it's 5G, 6G, 6.5G. Um, we are getting into batteries, lithium batteries. So I think we will do what it, whatever is needed and whatever we can do, we will do. But the point, fundamental point is the opportunity is huge. If India has to realize its potential, forget about whether we'll grow 6%, 6.5%, 7%, it's good for, good for some headlines every other week. I think the opportunity is even double digit. But that doesn't mean that it's easy. Okay, I think what opportunity is not there? You take um, consumption. I think the trends are very clear. Um, India is becoming a formal economy. Um, the aspiration of the people is increasing. The per capita income is going to increase. The affordable affordability for spending is increased. And then, you know, once we cross, I think there is enough theory that the 3,000 mark, once it crosses, 
then you see a hockey hockey stick in consumption. Whether it's three thousand dollars, three thousand five hundred dollars, we don't know. But at the same time, we have a lot of disparity. One 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 state is at eight thousand dollars, and another state is at eight hundred dollars. So we got to figure out a way to fix it if you want to really capture the true power of consumption. Second thing is demography. I think Amitabh Khan talked about the age and so on and so forth. So we have got to do skilling, and we have to do 21st century skilling. We have got to differentiate between what is the industrial skilling we need to, what is the digital skilling we need to do. Similarly, in the whole infrastructure, B2B side, all these industries, everywhere there is so much growth opportunity. So we, but it's going to require a lot of hard work. It's not going to be very. It's going to be a little bit chaotic. because order doesn't come and indians by general we like confusion clarity out of chaos okay i mean we see the see the way we drive so we like that we're we're at ease with little bit little bit conf- <laughs> little bit chaos thank you very much amitabh khan falguri nair and chandrashekharan and uday kotak appreciate your time